Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, trust that we've been uh, filled with a lot of uh, food. So uh, I hope this will keep you awake. Uh, this topic keeps me awake at night sometimes. So hopefully it will be quite a, a thought-provoking uh, topic this afternoon. So last week we covered uh, the first hard question, right? And, and who remembers what it was? It was the problem of suffering, right? If God is all good and God is all powerful, why is there suffering? Uh, why, why does suffering exist? Uh, today, we are looking at what I think is an even harder question, and it's called the problem of hell. Let's, uh, let's go to the scripture reading, Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, and Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. I read for you. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So, uh, for many of us, I'm sure if we have not asked this question ourselves, uh, someone might have come up to us and say, Hey, you're Christian, right? So, here's the question. If God is a God of love, why would He send people to hell? It's a very sensitive topic. Why? Because all of us, I'm sure, uh, and many people, right, they, have, they, they don't believe in Jesus, or they, they have close friends and family who don't believe in Jesus. And so there's so much sensitivity to it. So when we're talking about hell, we need to talk about it with lots of uh, uh, gentleness and sensitivity. And uh, the, first, uh, the first offense... Uh, that people take is that they think we are being narrow-minded. They say, "What well, you you think you think I'm going to hell?" They always say that, right? So you think I'm going to hell? Siri. Oh no, Siri! No. <laughs> I guess Siri thinks. Uh, <laughs> okay. Right, hell seems to be such a crude and barbaric idea, right? So what's our strategy? Like last week, the, the first thing is, uh, the best defense is a good offense. So let's ask, uh, here's the first offense. Uh, the consequences do not narrow the mind. Right? First, we need to defend ourselves. We are not being narrow-minded. You are being narrow-minded as well. Because narrow-mindedness is not about your view or your beliefs. Even if you, if you think that all the gods are the same and there are many ways into heaven, then you're being narrow-minded. Why? Because you think you're better than the, the rest. You think, you, you think you're better than the Christians. You think you're, you're better than uh, people who adhere to just one religion. Right? Open-mindedness is about your willingness to engage in dialogue. That's why we are even doing this series so that we can engage people in dialogue. And just because the consequences are more severe, it doesn't mean that we are being narrow-minded. Let me give you an example to illustrate the point. Uh, one day, it's my wife. Here. Okay, uh, one day, my my wife and I we were having lunch, and uh, we had we took out the kimchi from the fridge. And and I smelled the kimchi. Oh, it smells a bit, you know, old, like a bit alcoholic, you know. Uh, she thought it was fine. I thought that her mistake, right? I have this view of the kimchi. The kimchi is spoiled, right? I thought if we eat this kimchi, we're gonna have a bad tummy ache and even food poisoning, right? It's very severe. For her, her viewpoint was the kimchi is fine. So if we, eat, if, if we don't eat the kimchi, right, then what? Nothing lah. We just don't have kimchi for lunch. So the consequences of... Uh, my view had more severe consequences. Her view didn't have, but we are still being equally narrow-minded about the kimchi. We will not budge on the topic. In the end, I gave in. We ate the kimchi, no tummy ache. Okay, so, right, offense number two. If hell is out of the picture, is it a better picture? If hell is out of the picture, is it a better picture? So many cultures in this world, we, we have this view of uh, divine retribution, right? We have this, some sort of image. For some reason, if someone commits a sin and is not caught, we have this feeling that, that, that justice is going to be, is going to happen no matter what. This idea is so powerful, even, even atheists, they are controlled by this idea, right? 
what do we what do people say? You know, watch out, huh? Karma is gonna come for you, you know. Something like that, right? We say things like this. What about the idea of hell? Hell is the idea that people get what they deserve even after death. So that death is not some sort of escape. If you commit a sin that, that's so great, but, uh, but you just like, I don't know, you, you, uh, like, uh, for example, you know those movies where, where the, you, there's a spy and he's supposed to capture the bad guy and, the, and his commander tells him what? We need him alive. He has to pay. We cannot let him die. You know, something like that, right? But there are so many people in this world, they, they, are, they are so uh, wicked, they're so evil, they do horrible things. And they just die like that without getting justice. One of those is, is a world without hell is a world in which the depth of injustice is not balanced. Evil doesn't pay. If death was merely the end, there would be a huge debt of injustice. But what if there's no hell? What if there's a heaven but no hell and everyone goes there in the end? Right? They, they, you don't need to repent. You just go to heaven. Everyone goes there. Let's take a second to imagine what if that happened. If every single person on this earth, good or bad, righteous, wicked, slave or oppressor, Hitler and Stalin, everyone ends up in the afterlife without repentance. I don't know what that place is, but it's, uh, that's not heaven. Why? Because the cycle of sin and hatred will go on. You, 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 everyone goes to heaven, you see that guy who bullied you in high school, you see that person who committed all these sins, what are you going to do? Right? All the criminals of the earth, the murderers, the child abusers, the rapists, the corrupt politicians. It's going to be earth again. So unless the, sin of, unless the curse of sin is broken, any idea of an eternal afterlife spent together can only be hellish, if not hell itself. So writes the, this author, John Milton, uh, a, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. And so if atheists were to entertain this idea of a God of love who lets everyone go to heaven, then they need to. This is the real question that they're asking. Right? It's a bit small. If God is a God of love, why would He send people to hell? If everyone were to go to heaven, we would obviously live together in peace and harmony as we do on earth. Not quite the case, right? Now, let's go to our defense. What is a God of love? We need, to, uh, we need to define our terms, right? What is a God of love? Because for some people, they think that God is, you know, ha, you've sinned, now off to hell with you, right? And God enjoys that for some reason. Theologians, conservative theologians, have this way of describing God. They say that God is... Simple. Simple not as in stupid, or, but simple as in not complex. Simple as in not having multiple parts. And the, uh, the key word here, the key phrase is, God is not made out of parts. And this is a very important doctrine that we need to know. It's called the doctrine of divine simplicity the doctrine of divine simplicity. And why is it important? It's important because without this doctrine, then all of God's attributes, for example, His anger, His justice, His love, all these, all these different attributes are at war with one another. Right? So if God sees someone's sin, his love wants to forgive, but His justice wants to judge. His love wants to save, His justice wants to condemn. And so if we don't have this doctrine of divine, uh, divine simplicity, we end up with a God who is schizophrenic. You know what schizophrenia, right? Like two minds, two different persons in, in, in one, you know, one body kind of thing. Uh, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, 
kind of thing. If we don't have this doctrine of divine simplicity, then this is, then, then this is the, answer, the necessary answer. If God is a God of love, why would He send people to hell? Because in some cases, God's justice won against God's love. God's attributes are constantly at war with each other. That is not the God of the Bible. Okay, that is not the God of the Bible. God is not schizophrenic. God is not compartmentalized. He is simple. He has only one divine essence. And depending on our perspective, that essence looks or we experience different parts of God. For example, um, like love, justice, wrath, holiness, and so on. So what does this mean? The doctrine of divine simplicity means that God's love is God's justice. That's an equal sign. God's love is God's justice. God's justice is God's wrath. God's wrath is God's holiness, and so on and so forth. It's looking at one thing, but from different perspectives, depending on what? Depending on our relationship to that thing. Depending on our relationship to God. For example, a drowning man will see, uh, a drowning man, right, he, he sees water as death. But a man dying of thirst, he sees the water as life. What matters is our relationship to that object. And the Bible tells us there are two kinds of people. The, the first group, the first kind, will tremble in fear when God brings about His justice. But the second will rejoice. The wicked tremble on the day of judgment, when God brings about His judgment. But the righteous rejoice. So the main point is this. We need to understand that God is one. He is not schizophrenic. And in order for us to understand what hell is, we need to understand first who or what God is. The Bible tells us that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is three persons who share the same divine essence. Three persons, right? One God. And this is what we call a, a true and pure relationality, right? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from time eternal. This is what we mean when, we say, when the Bible says, right? This is what the Bible means. It says God is love. Why? Because God is not dependent on us. If God is just one, one person, then in the time before He created us, He couldn't be loved. That means He depends on us to be called love. But that's not the case. Why? Because God is three in one. God is love. And God's love is also God's justice. What does that mean? Right? Love means that there is no disharmony in the relationship. The relationship is, is pure. But if there's disharmony, that means that one person feels wronged somehow. And if there's this disharmony, that means that in some way, shape or form, there has been injustice. And when there's injustice, that means there is wrath. Right? There's anger. We know this, right? If you, uh, me, uh, me and my friend, if I feel that I've been wrong somehow. I'm going to be upset about it. That's going to lead to disharmony. It's going to lead to wrath and anger. So wrath is about justice. Justice is about harmony. Harmony is about love. In God, they are one and the same. It's the same God. That's why God is called love in one passage and a consuming fire in another. Are they different gods? A lot of people think that God of the Old Testament is like this wrathful God who judges. And then Jesus in the New Testament is a God who, who forgives and is all loving. What they don't realize is that Jesus taught the most about hell. Jesus, if you look at the statistics, He, is, he taught the most about hell. Right? 
Now, in the, in the Ten Commandments, we see this because the first four commandments are about harmony with us and God, between humans and God. But the, six, the last six commandments are harmony are about harmony between man and man, neighbors, right? And so if you break the Ten Commandments, if you break any of God's commandments, what you're doing is you're introducing disharmony between us and, and God, us and each other. So when we say that God is a God of love, we also say that because He is a God of love, He is a God of justice. And because He is a God of justice, He is a God of wrath. Against what? Evil and wickedness. A God of love will never compromise on justice and judgment. A God of love will always be wrathful toward anyone who sins against his neighbor. So we can answer our question like this. What is a God of love? A God of love is a God of justice, wrath, and judgment. God is not made of different parts. He is simple. Okay, so this is our first answer to the, the problem of hell. The first answer is God is a God of love, but God is simple. He is not compartmentalized. He is not schizophrenic. Defense number two. What about good people who didn't believe in Jesus? Why should they go to hell? Right, and, and in this question, uh, people always bring up Gandhi for some reason. I don't know why. They always say, what about Gandhi? Yeah. Like, you know, some, like, like uh, he did so many good works and so on. But the Bible tells us two things. First of all, the, the idea of goodness, right? The standard for goodness, what is good and evil is God Himself. He sets the standard. It's not about, it's not some idea of goodness that is apart from God. And second, all people fall short of God's goodness. All people fall short of God's righteousness. And no one can be saved by their good works. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. G.K. Chesterton once said, the doctrine of original sin is the one doctrine that can be proven outside the Bible. There is something desperately broken in human beings. Uh, do you know how many people have uh, died in, a, in the past century due to human causes? Like uh, war, murder, uh, so on and so forth. It's crazy. I have this book at home called The, the Rape of Nanking. Uh, it talks about the Japanese occupation in uh, China, in that city, and there are even pictures, and, and I, I look at it every... I, actually, I hide it. I don't want to look at it because it's so... It's, tr it's horrible. For any of us who oppose this idea... There's a simple challenge. Uh, speak. Uh, can we have a volunteer? No, just kidding. Okay. Uh, sp for a day or five minutes even, speak everything that comes into your mind. All your thoughts, every single thought that comes into your mind, whether you're talking with your friends, family, or your spouse, see what happens. If all of us had the power to read minds, it's, uh, it's going to be a very bad show. Uh, who watched... Uh, the Netflix series, uh, Sandman. No one watch? Really? Wow, okay, never mind. Let's, let's forget the example then. Okay, All right. So C.S. Lewis says this, It is not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there is something growing which will be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. Right? Because all of us have sin. We all have sin inside us. So the question uh, so how do we respond to this question? What about the good people? Well, we just need to replace the word good with the word sinless. What about 
good, sinless people who didn't believe in Jesus. Why should they go to hell? The thing is, sinless people don't go to hell. But there are no sinless people. Then comes a follow-up question, usually. Wait a minute, you're telling me that the sins I commit in this life, this short time on earth, is going to send me to hell for eternity? So then, here comes another question. Isn't hell too extreme? Why should a finite sin incur or cause an infinite consequence? Have you thought about this before? Isn't hell a bit extreme? Right? Isn't hell a place where you suffer for eternity? Why should you suffer for, for eternity when you've only sinned for a finite amount of time? You call that justice? But the thing is, the, the severity, right, the, 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 the wickedness or the greatness of a sin depends on two factors. First is the nature of the sin, of course. Right? What, what kind of sin was it? You spit in someone's coffee or you slap the person or something. You know, there are different levels of sin as well. But more importantly, the status or the value of the person sinned against, that matters as well. Right? We, I'm sure you all heard this example from me before. Right? If, if you spat into my coffee, you know, I'm quite chill, I think. You can just make me another coffee. Now, if you spat into... Um, you spat into pastor's coffee. I think it's quite chill also. But you spat into Mr. Lee Sien Long's coffee or Lawrence Wong's coffee. Okay, you might be in more trouble. What about God himself, right? The status of the person being sinned against, that matters, right? And God created the whole universe. He is infinite in status and value. Your sin against him therefore incurs what? an infinite consequence. Does that make sense? Right? The, 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 the reputation, the status of the person you sin against matters a lot. Right? And King David, he, he, he took Uriah's wife for himself and he had Uriah killed. But during his repentance, in Psalm 51, this is what he says, against you, he's talking to God, right? against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and, blame you, and blameless in your judgment. But wait a minute. David didn't sin against God. One. Like, he sinned against uh, Uriah and his wife. Why does David say, against God have I sinned? He acknowledged that all sin is against God because all people belong to God. He understood that all people are precious in God's sight. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. This is God speaking. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die, therefore. You know, um, we, I think it was uh, teacher, the deaconess, uh, Le Ting or deaconess, Wei-Tian, someone's baby shower. And you know at the baby shower, you have all these games, right? And they had this doll, you know, this baby doll where the husbands will usually practice race and, and to, to wrap the diaper or something, change the diaper. And I remember uh, Deacon Wei Tong was there and Gloria was just a baby back then. Gloria was just this little baby. And I think it was Tim. You, you know Tim? Uh, he, he took a baby doll next to Wei Tong, said, Gloria, Gloria. <gasps> and then he dropped the doll on the floor. <laughs> and... <laughs> uh, uh, Wow, I've never heard Deacon Wei Tong shout like that before. Actually, I've never heard him shout before. But that time was the one time I knew. This, I knew why he's a major right now in the army. Okay? Because that was scary. Okay? The anger and the wrath you feel when someone sins against your child is the same anger that God feels when we sin against another person. In fact, He loves us so much. He loves us so, so much than any parent could ever love their children so much more. And so his wrath burns hotter than we could ever imagine against the person who sins against another. It's an eternal wrath and it rages on at an eternal temperature. That's why hell is called the lake of fire. 
where the worm does not die. Hell represents God's wrath against sin. Mark chapter 9, verses 47 to 48. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So to summarize, when we sin, even against a child of God, we invoke His infinite wrath. We incur an infinite debt of sin because God is infinite and all who belong to Him, therefore, right, are precious in His sight. All things, when we sin against another, incur an infinite debt. So here's our reply to the question, isn't hell too extreme? Why should a finite sin incur an infinite consequence? The answer is, there is no finite sin because there is no finite God. And just to throw the gospel in here for a bit, imagine all the sins of this world, okay? The, the wars, the crimes, the violence, the injustice. Imagine all of that, the wrath of God against all that sin was poured into a cup. This, the, in the Bible, there's this image of the cup of judgment, the cup of God's wrath. That was the cup that Jesus drank. Do you think physical pain alone was enough for Jesus to pray this prayer? Right? Jesus said, right, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You think Jesus was scared about the nails? An author puts it this way. God's anger at the Holocaust, God's anger at the slave trade, God's anger at abuse and murder and cruelty and neglect was all poured out on Jesus on the cross. This was what he dreaded. Not the nails in his hands. So in conclusion, running from the infinite wrath of God, right? the, the story of the Bible tells us that on the day of judgment, those who are clothed in the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, they have had their sins removed from them. And God will not even remember their sins. And this is what the Bible promises us, right? Psalm, Psalm chapter 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. What about those who reject Jesus Christ? Well, you will wear that sin and guilt for eternity. Imagine, right, now let's imagine if you could freely move between heaven and hell right, in the afterlife. You can freely move between heaven and hell. Imagine this, you've rejected Christ, you have you, all the sins that you, you have committed in the past, you wear them. Right, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says that what they are all filthy rags. We are clothed in these filthy rags. Imagine that. And you go to heaven where everyone else is clothed gloriously in the white robes of the saints. And for you, your sins are on display for all to see. My question for you is, how long do you think you can stay? I, I, imagine, it's totally up to you. You can move freely between heaven and hell. How long would you stay there? Everyone is clean and forgotten. All their sins are forgotten. They are wearing the white robes. They are as glorious. Right? They are shining with the glory of Jesus Christ and you're there in filthy rags. How long could you stay? The King of Heaven hates your sin with an infinite wrath. The King of Heaven Himself hates you, hates that sin. How long dare you stay? And in the end, the wrath of God will be poured out on sinners so terrible, right? This is what they will say in the end. Revelation chapter 6, verse 16. Calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Sinners will call on the mountains and rocks to fall on them, to, to hide them. So when all is said and done, Right? People will behold, all people will behold the undiluted glory and majesty of Jesus. God won't even need to tell us where to go. Right? 
And Jesus told a story about this uh, in, in Luke chapter 16. You know, the story of the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And the, and the rich man, he's in hell. Lazarus is in heaven in the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man says to Abraham, Hey, can you send him? He, he asks for several things, okay? The rich man asks Abraham, Hey, can you send Lazarus over with some water to, just to cool my tongue from this pain? And Abraham says, No. And then the rich man then asks Abraham, Can you please send someone to my five brothers? who are still alive, and tell them that hell is real so that they can avoid being tormented in this place. And Abraham says, right, if they don't, if, uh, if they don't believe from all the previous witness, they will not believe with another. Something like that, right? What the rich man doesn't ask, what the rich man does not ask Abraham is, why am I here? He never asked that because all who are in hell on the final day, they will know clearly why they are there. Right? The rich man knew he deserved hell. So were all who flee from God into hell on the last day. And so the question for us today is this. Will we nail our sins to the cross and live for the glory of God in this life? Or, we will, or will we live in the wrath of God in the next? In the words of C.S. Lewis, there are only two kinds of people, those who say to God, Thy will be done, or those to whom God in the end says, Thy will be done. I pray that, uh, in like the way I, I like my sticks, uh, we will not be well done in the end. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, we, we thank you for this time that we could uh, approach this hard question about hell. Lord, we ask that you equip us to be able to, to answer boldly to these difficult questions so that we can show your glory and show the beauty of Jesus Christ. Lord, our sins incurred an infinite wrath and an infinite debt. But Lord, because of Jesus Christ, the infinite man who died on the cross for our sins, we can be forgiven and our sins can be removed as far as from the east is from the west. And you have forgotten all our sins. So we thank you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.